I think uh, the, the trip to Aspen itself was, you know, from a physical point of view, the nature, the beauty of the place is, is, uh, is fabulous. But the concept, I thought, uh, and, the, and the way they went about doing what they did through their seminars and all, and the kind of ideas, the thoughts it provokes in you, uh, I found very, very interesting. And I mean, when I came back, that's something that I was reflecting on quite a bit, which is that if, you know, if I try and distill all the things that have happened in this country, I would say the two sort of uh, seminal events were, you know, independence, for which we prepared in a certain sense, because you fought for it and, and, and you spent a long time after that stitching together a country, bringing it together, building a constitution, building institutions. And then came 1991, which in a sense the country was just not prepared for. It was something that just happened. And I think that things that have happened in this country post that have actually reflected uh, that sort of an event where we are continuously scrambling to catch up with, with being part of the world, you know. Uh, and it's reflected in, in many ways in, in our stance on various things, uh, you know, globally. Uh, it has not been uh, Indian polity that has gone uh, overseas or gone abroad and decided to, to figure out how to work with the rest of the world. Actually, in many ways, it's been Indian business that has gone out and had been at the forefront of it. Uh, so the question then is that if, if you are, uh, quote unquote, going to be one of the emerging powers in the 21st century, how does the leadership in this country, uh, which by then will consist of young people today who are being brought up uh, and have a very different version and a view of India as compared to even the time when I was in university or, or time I was graduating, to participate in that, in that leadership. Uh, and I think a lot of what we have been doing since then in Aspen has actually flown out of, out of that conviction uh, and that feeling, that, that need uh, to, to actually bring in the younger people from this country in to give them an arena, give them a platform, let them be heard. This is not about uh, getting things done as much as getting things heard. Uh, and hopefully there are like-minded people who will identify each other in an audience like this over the next two and a half days. And they will form their own groups and their own catalysts and get going. And our own initiative, like the Indian Leadership Initiative, which I think is quite unique in terms of what it does, uh, have, been, have been, I think, a tremendous catalysts in this area. So to me, uh, getting Aspen going and getting the idea of Aspen has, has germinated out of, these, uh, out of this kind of a thought process. Uh, and so far, I have to say, uh, judging by the presence of so many people here at 10 o'clock in the morning, I think we're doing a reasonably good job. We um, started this India Leadership sure. Initiative for young people from different segments of society, political, civil servants, industry. Um, and I think we've covered about uh, 50 people sure. so far in the last couple of years. Uh, do you think it's something we can scale up and, and do much more of this and cover many more young people? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, even if it's, I think that the format is something that, that we can scale up. Uh, the issue always becomes one of resources. And in this case, I'm not talking so much resources in terms of money, just in terms of people, trained people who, who can actually guide and, and, uh, and work with these youngsters. But by what I have seen from the 50 that we have been able to pull up and the fact that they come from such a, a spectrum of young India. You know, you've got NGOs in there, uh, you've got uh, politicians in there, you've got bureaucrats. I mean, it's amazing to me that we get the government of India to release young people, uh, you know, to come and uh, to, to take part in this. Of course, we have uh, the corporate leadership, uh, you've got academics. Uh, so it's a wide, wide spread of, of young people. And the enthusiasm for it is, is tremendous. And the fact that they stay together and in touch with each other after going through this also tells me that there is something more in this than just another, uh, you know, another uh, leadership training program, which is not what it really is. Yeah. What, what is it uh, in you as a business person? Um, what, what's driving you right now? You have, uh, what are you, a third generation? Third generation, uh, yeah. Business yeah. family, mm -hmm. uh, Thapar family, you have, um, you inherited uh, companies were in 
deep distress at that time. Well, they I were almost gone. We were writing yeah. your obituaries. Yes. Uh, True. Uh, True. What is it? Ten years ago, or more? Uh, yeah, about twelve years ago. Twelve years ago, we were writing your obituaries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did you go through? What what? Oh. What happened? <laughs> Maybe, uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a tough one for me to answer because, you know, the feelings I went through when I was actually turning things around to, to where we are today are difficult. But it's taught me a few things. Number one is that despite the best attempts of academic institutions to, to define leadership, it's something that actually, you know, comes from within. Uh, it's very difficult to say what it is, but uh, when you sign up, at least in the corporate world, in my opinion, when you sign up to be the chairman, when you sign up to, see, to be a CEO, uh, I don't think people really appreciate and understand that you are basically sacrificing your entire life to the cause of the business. You know, it's quite amazing uh, the amount of time it takes up. Uh, and it's very difficult to, uh, to, to explain to people the emotional attachment to it. And, uh, and then decision making is not black and white. You know, that has been the biggest learning out of it. You know, the, and the issues that confront you as India modernizes, if I give you one uh, example, uh, if you look at the last seven or eight years, we talk about growth in this country, but we talk about the fact that the growth has not led to employment generation. The reason is quite simple. We talk about our uh, labor laws. I don't think the issue is there. I think the issue lies simply because uh, the moment India has become part of the world community, especially in terms of financial markets, it has been far cheaper for Indian business to put capital to use as opposed to labor. You know? uh, add to that the experience of 40, 45 years of a controlled economy, and you can see where everybody's thought process is that if I can get a dollar so cheaply, why do I want to hire 500 people? Let me put that cheap dollar to use and hire 50 people, all right, and not have to deal with these issues, all right. Uh, the corresponding to some of these are, are the other problems that I think Indian industry is going to face with it, you know, and, and is facing right now, which is that uh, I looked at data just yesterday, actually, on a flight back from London, I looked at data which says that 45% uh, of all new jobs in a country like the United States is created by companies that employ less than 500 people, all right. And 33% of all new jobs are created by companies that employ less than 50 people, all right. And I think if you went into this country and you looked at that segment of our economy, and other, you would find very similar structures. Yet if you look at what is it that is done to actually support those, those uh, businesses, uh, the answer is very, very little. The access to credit is not there. The access to technology is limited. Access to modern management practices are, are limited. Uh, it's, you know, so you just wonder that these are entrepreneurs who struggle against huge odds. If there was even a 10% improvement in any of those areas, what could they not achieve, you know? Uh, and so we, we've got going on a few initiatives which you're aware of in, in that area as well. We've got the Center for Competitiveness, now we're starting the, the, the business school, which is focusing primarily on small and medium enterprises. And then we talk about how to skill these people and, and looking at a new paradigm of saying, how do we educate in a very different way? You educate in a manner in which you actually create the conditions that allow that employment generation to take place. Uh, we keep saying that services is not the answer for the future of the country in terms of employment, yet we do very little. To, to do anything to actually change that process. When did you um, start moving out of the country in terms of not exports, but you know, in terms of acquisition of companies, investing, and what triggered that? Uh, nine, uh, we moved, our first acquisition was in 2006. We, start, we started negotiating in, uh, in 2005, but uh, our first one was in 2006. And uh, it was driven by the same thing, as I said, that you know, 91 to 95, the opening up was, was very rapid, and I think we were all unprepared for it. But by 97, 98, it was clear to me that in many of the businesses, at least that we operated in, uh, global competition was already in India. You know, let's say in the transmission distribution business where today CG is the fourth largest producer in the world, CG was always the largest in India, but so was Siemens in India, so was ABB here, so was, um, you know, Astom Arriva here. Uh, so was everybody. So the question I put to the management at that time was that 
you know, how competitive are we vis-a-vis -vis these competitors because I don't see, uh, they are Indian competitors, they exist in India today, so I'm not going to treat them as multinational, I will treat them as Indian competitors and what do we know about them and from that started a search which led to our first acquisition. Uh, we have made uh, nine others since then, uh, we are a four billion dollar business but funnily enough quietly uh, half my assets uh, are outside India and 65% of revenues now come from outside of India. We employ more or less the same number of people, about 22,000, about 10,000 outside of India and about 12,000, you know, in India. Where are you outside India? Which, which countries? Uh, and, and U.S., Canada, uh, Ireland, we'll probably be in the U.K. pretty soon, Belgium, Hungary, France, Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, we are looking at seriously in Italy right now. Uh, so, you know, and it's different businesses have been driven, uh, you know, have been driven by very different needs. But uh, very clearly today we see in certain businesses a need for technology being far greater than anything else. And the, 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 uh, the very average state of Indian research and development also drives us to markets where, where we think technology would be available and that technology would help us to jump a learning curve in India as well in terms of being able to deploy market leadership into, you know, technology leadership and thereby, you know, create new streams of business for ourselves. So your corporate headquarters is still essentially yeah. Indian? Yeah. We, we like to say that we are an Indi Indian uh, multinational. You are an Indian multinational? An Indian multinational. And your core team here are Indian? Indians, one, uh, one non-Indian, but uh, the, the key four members are Indian. Able to cope with the world, with this new... Never. No? Never. I mean, there's always... Uh, there's, you know, there's always something new to be done uh, and I find integration is a, a little bit of a challenge. The same issue that I referred to earlier in terms of uh, our preparedness, I think even our corporate leadership is not fully prepared for, for, for that. And these are issues which, you know, if you, if you go to the essence of democracy uh, in any way, there's uh, all elements in that society come together in mutual trust to create institutions that allow democracy to function. And I think similarly in business, you have to have those, inst you, know, you have to have people who trust each other, who can then come together to build the institutions in business, the, the systems, the processes that allow the businesses to flourish. We've improved rapidly. Uh, we've had our pains, but uh, today I would say that compared to even a year ago, the, the leadership across different businesses is far more international in terms of in terms of decision making, in terms of people in positions of, of decision making authority. Uh, but I guess in a certain sense it flows from the top. It is also my desire that, that you know, we cannot consider ourselves to be a global or an Indian multinational if we are not prepared to also look at the decision making uh, uh, process and include people there in terms of merit, uh, not in terms of loyalty or in terms of, of, of those issues. Yeah. You have participated in the uh, strategic dialogue that's track two mm -hmm. with USA. You've also been in the dialogue with Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you make time for this and is it interesting? Is it useful? I think three, uh, this would be a discussion between my uncle, um, uh, you know, Lalit Mohan Thapa, who passed away three years ago, and myself about this issue. And uh, he always thought I was trying to retire him early, you know. Because I kept telling him that, you know, you, I have to move out of the CEO's role because uh, running six companies where I'm managing director in one but still running five others uh, is not the best uh, corporate governance and certainly is going to lead to mistakes. And so that he needed to retire and become chairman emeritus or whatever it is and he needed to let me step up and take on the chairman's role. And we used to have a lot of discussion about this until finally he, he agreed with me in 2005. And so that's what I did. Uh, 2000, late 2005, I basically pick, uh, gave up my day-to-day -day responsibility in all the companies and elevated myself to the chairman. And so the last four years or three and a half years has been a process of putting together, uh, putting together a management team, uh, a management leadership team, like a management board, which would basically take the group's strategic and other thrusts and, and governance issues forward and leave me a little free to what I believe uh, should be the role, my role in, in a large, which is to look at new opportunities, but also to look at building or at least putting the seeds in place of new institutions that will contribute to both 
the businesses that we run, new opportunities, but also contribute towards a, a, a 21st century India as opposed to a 19th century India. And uh, the biggest learning out of that is the, that the, you have to be willing to share your, and give up a lot of power and authority. But by giving up that power and authority, I feel I have become far more empowered in terms of ability to get things done uh, as opposed to actually uh, being the MD. And I think that's something that I try to explain to, to a lot of my contemporaries, not with a great deal of success, but we keep trying. You're um, also leading and chairing a university, yeah. a private university, yeah. the Thapar University. Yeah. And is that uh, successful? Quote unquote operation? Is it growing? How is it doing as a private, <laughs> private university? Uh, but if you go by lists, and we seem to like lists a lot, it's a successful uh, university. It's one of the top private uh, engineering universities in the country. It's grown. It's grown very rapidly in the last four years, and uh, we will continue to grow. Uh, we are up to almost uh, seven, six and a half, seven thousand students now. New campus coming up uh, in Chandigarh. So, so yeah, and I think it's it's also the issue. Uh, when we talk about education uh, and, and uh, why a, a forum like this is very important, uh, we know what the problems of education in this country are. We know them, all right. But when I talked about trust in civil trust in society and trust to build institutions, we also know that the reason things get stopped is that 60% of the elected members uh, of parliament today are involved in the business of education. How are you going to bring about change uh, if the whole focus of education becomes one of profit and loss as opposed to the second leg of that which is a contribution to society. And I think that till you don't address these issues of conflict, it is very difficult to, to move forward in terms of, in terms of reform. It's, uh, I was involved with the Pratham India Education Trust for five or six years and you saw uh, some of the effect that that had at the primary and secondary education level. Uh, but at the higher education level today, it's, um, and, uh, and at the secondary education level today, there, there is an issue there. That, in a, that issue is that your own legislators, your own lawmakers are also sitting, <laughs> uh, you know, involved ha heavily in, in, in the business of education. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We'll see you again. Well, we're going to conclude this uh, first half an hour and conversation with uh, Gautam Thapar. Um, let me just say that uh, when you um, meet and listen to and interact uh, with Gautam Thapar, I definitely feel that there is hope <laughs> for this country and hope for Indian business. I've spent 46 years of my life with Indian business and um, sometimes uh, feeling very frustrated and depressed. Uh, but I think in him, we have a young business leader, as I said earlier, third generation in the family, but uh, uniquely uh, global and uniquely enlightened. So thank you very much, Gautam. Thanks, sir. <laughs> Wonderful to have you here, sir. Thank Again. you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming back for the second time. Thank you. Thank and uh, I hope I can reserve your diary for next year. <laughs> Some, somebody came to me earlier and said that, you know, I want to ask Professor Sen to address us in October next year. I said, you know, I, I don't think that gives him a year notice, so you, you might not be lucky, but you can try. But uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you for coming in well, last I'm evening delighted from, to be back from here. the U.S. And you're looking great. Thank you. And thank I, you. I must Young. also thank my co-conspirator in getting you here, Shugato Bose, who, who's Did here. Yes, he, he, Shugato is there. Right. Okay. Uh, he's going to speak <laughs> later. <laughs> Gautam, over to you. Uh, Dr. Sen, fantastic to see you here again. This is the fourth, I think, time I'm sharing a, a dais with you. So, like Tarun, I think that we probably have to make sure that you become a permanent part of the fixture out here more than anything else. But uh, thank you. Uh, we were just talking, Tarun and I were just talking a little bit about uh, India, about business, about everything else. Uh, I just want to, to come to the topic which I think uh, has come up in your, in your new book, which is the, the concept of justice. Uh, justice as opposed to the way most of us would look at it, which is uh, courts, law, uh, a legal code. Uh, 
whereas I think you've gone for a much broader definition of justice in your book. You know, so maybe you can uh, talk to us a little bit about this concept and about, about uh, your writings. On this. Well, I think the, um, the book is a, is a book in philosophy. And I'm, um, I have to say I'm quite pleased by it, the fact that it also seems to have had a general audience, which is what I was hoping, hoping because it is really, a, uh, in fact, it's a purely philosophy book and attempts to take on the standard view of justice in the theory of justice, which is a dominant part of political philosophy. And it's an attempt to depart from what I truly see as mainstream political philosophy today. Uh, of, um, in the constructing uh, a theory of justice in the shadow of uh, social contract theory, which has been the dominant idea in, in all this. Um, it has a feature of thinking justice in terms of an imagined hypothetical state in which you state of being, where you don't know who you're going to be and you decide what would be the just rules. It has tended to have the feature of A looking for perfection rather than uh, improvement, of, so, uh, uh, improvement of justice by removal of injustice. So it has that, what I call the transcendental feature. It's an, an institutional feature. It looks for rules and as we know in India as well as anywhere else, perfect rules don't often lead to perfect results so that you have to look at, the, at what actually happens on the ground. And that is actually a big distinction in the early Indian jurisprudence, going back a long time. Um, niti in the form of just institutions, just rules, as opposed to naya, in terms of justice or what actually happens on the ground. Most of the Indian jurists have tended to, I mean ancient jurists I'm thinking of, have tended to focus on, um, on Niti. Um, and that's true of a great uh, Indian lawgiver named the Manu also. On the other hand, there's a tradition of Naya which is very strong and it surfaces as much a Naya as a state of play where the big fish can eat the small fish is regarded as unjust no matter how good the rules are. So I think there's a distinction that I think is also a critique, not just of, of Manu, but also of, um, of Immanuel Kant and Thomas Hobbes and so on. So look for what is happening on the ground. Uh, thirdly, there is a, uh, a feature that it should not be constrained on there being a political unit. It's global. And uh, Gautam, you have emphasized by Tarun to be a global uh, presence here. And, and uh, I want your presence in the theory of justice. That, that's, the, that's the idea. Um, it's also about understanding that while a sense of injustice is a very important signal that you should think about that issue, you have to supplement it by reason yes. at some stage. And that's... Um, so these are the points, and then there's a lot of application. This is hot water. Yes. No, I don't want hot water. Either cold water or hot tea or hot coffee. <laughs> hot tea. Hot yeah. Tea. Ah, thank you very much. Um, uh, the um, uh, and I'm, I'm and uh, there's a lot of uh, applications. I begin with 18th century debates about slavery, the subjugation of women in which a lot of the great people, Adam Smith, Marquis de Condorcet, uh, Tom Paine, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, mm -hmm. the earliest feminist thinker, um, were involved later on, um, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, concerned with removal of subjugation of women or subjugation of the, of the underdog classes. And I think that tradition is a, is a Naya tradition. Mm -hmm. And that's what it, the book is about. Now, I'm delighted that the book has been fairly well received uh, in the sense of... Um, um, I see it everywhere. I, 
I see it in pirated edition too, which is always very flattering <laughs> for the author. I've been so far, been two occasions, there have been an attempt to sell me a copy of the book <laughs> at, a, at, a, at, a, at a traffic signal. And one of them even told me that it was a good book. Uh, <laughs> and I said, um, um, uh, I, 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 and he said, you must get it. I said, no, I, I still don't want it. And <laughs> then he said, it's very good and very cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I want to be. I want it to be very cheap, to be available, yeah. so, and hopefully it is reasonably good. Leading on from, the, from what you just said in the concept of Niti and Nyai, is there a reconciliation uh, between these two? Uh, no, I don't think you look for reconciliation. They're two different ideas. Mm -hmm. It's like um, the importance of... I mean, any... I mean, I am basically a Naya person. I see the role of Niti as an instrument. There are good rules we can have, mm -hmm. and it's certainly very important to have good rules rather than bad rules. I am, on the other hand, um, I'm not going to judge the rules in terms of their intrinsic goodness, but actually what it is doing to the world. If I contrast the social contract tradition with another philosophical tradition, beginning also in the 18th century as far as Western thinking is concerned, the antecedents uh, here and, and elsewhere, including China, Japan, the Middle East, but the... the um, Marquis de Condorcet, I mean, there's a whole group of French mathematicians, mm -hmm. Condorcet, Borda, and so on. Mostly in the French Academy of Sciences, they were very involved in constructing a science of, of thank you very much, uh, thank you, uh, constructing a science which would be, uh, yes, is it coffee or tea? Uh, okay, a little bit of milk, thank you, thank you. Um, that it would be, um, no, 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 I don't want to, thank you. Um, so it, that it would be um, possible to make comparative judgments. Is this a more just situation than another? Is this less unjust than another? And that's a long tradition. This, by the way, is the 250th anniversary of Adam Smith's first book, Theory of Moral Sentiments. It is not widely known but in many ways, it's the classic book of Smith, The Wealth of Nations, which is much more well-known. Smith always thought as a kind of elaboration of a particular side of the problem. A wealth of Nations is concerned to a great extent with instruments mm -hmm. and niti. Um, theory of all sentiments is very much about Naya. There is a 250th anniversary edition by Penguin Books, in which I have a long introduction to Smith about the relevance of that book and the connection between that. So I would say that you don't, it's not a question of reconciling, seeing that the institutions have their role, but you cannot be institutionalist in the sense of leaving it all in the hands of the institution. Say, I mean, a lot of people have done that among contemporary theorists. That is true of our greatest contemporary theorists of justice roles. It's true of, and, uh, true of my, um, another dear departed friend, Robert Nozick, mm -hmm. libertarian, um, a very active friend today, uh, Ronald Dworkin, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, David Gauthier. They, they have in different ways constructed their theory of justice on the basis of just rules and then you leave it in the hands okay. of the rules. I don't accept that. Okay. And, and I think in the Indian context, uh, and I'm moving now, the book is not about India, but in the India, I do, I do have a lot of Indian examples, the Indian context, it's very important to see what's happening to the ground. If, if it is the case, no matter how good your policies are, that um, a huge proportion of the Indian children are undernourished, yes. illiteracy is still rampant, um, women's subjugation has not disappeared, a mm -hmm. uh, lot of people can't get medical treatment, um, even though it's possible to organize it mm -hmm. um, uh, in an expensive way. Uh, but it's not organized, or not adequately anyway. Um, and then uh, that's it, that not people not receiving treatment, remaining illiterate, remaining hungry, remaining subjugated and tyrannized. Mm -hmm. That is 
injustice enough to recognize. I don't have to go to Nietzsche saying, where the rules good. The rules come and go. They have a role in making the world better. But they can't be things that we adore for their own sake. It, it, but, uh, and again, taking from that, because we talk, uh, you talk a lot about the you know, um, 18th century uh, thinkers about this issue. Uh, the world was a very different place, a much, uh, how should I say, a more narrow. These were philosophies that were particularly maybe contained between, within a state. All right, the thinker, the thoughts traveled, but the, the, the application of law was, was contained there. In today's context, with globalization, with everything else, we are seeing increasingly the limitations of some of the, the institutions that were set up, from the International Court of Justice or even the United Nations, X and Y and Z. But at the same time, we are also seeing individual states trying to extend their legal reach yeah. beyond the borders in, in areas which were uh, not just commercial anymore. You know, human rights, uh, you know, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, can you give us your view on... on well, I, I don't think you're absolutely right. And I think it's a very important point. Um, it's a point that was noted actually in the 18th century itself by no less than David Hume in 1770s when he said we used to live in states self-contained and now that we have uh, global economic relations, he's talking about early globalization. He's not talking about globalization from the point of view of the economic benefit it might bring. He's talking about the fact that we have come to have relationship with people we did not know, says David Hume. And as he put it, as we consider our relationship with other people, the, I think it's the exact word, is that the boundaries of justice even grow wider. There's no way you can escape it. As long as we didn't even know about them, we didn't have to think about it. So that's the one point to make, and what you're saying is that we have gone a long distance since uh, Hume's recognition in 1772. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, there were already international relations. One of the places where Adam Smith uses his reasoning about the need for global thinking powerfully in the, in the wealth of nations, as it happened, is in dealing with the, with the East India Company, mm -hmm. arguing why um, uh, the treatment of uh, India uh, in, uh, in particular Bengal, because that was the part of, uh, of, the, of the British Empire at that time. And uh, it's writing shortly after the famine of 1770, uh, saying why uh, the looking at the condition on the ground, the Naya-based theory, mm -hmm. they don't use the word obviously, mm -hmm. uh, in Naya-based theory, Smith says uh, the East India Company has proved itself to be totally unfit to govern any territory in the world. So already there are global things coming up, and some of the most powerful examples Smith talks about is exactly about that. One of the places where he talks about it is the slave trade, which is still going on. Mm -hmm. And he makes a statement, he often were given to making very strong statements. People don't read these parts of Smith. They all just read about the baker, butcher, and brewer, and everyone getting better off on the basis of trade and nothing else. Uh, but there is a, a place where he says he's obviously inflamed by what he think, thinks is white supremacist race rhetoric about the slaves being uh, unfit to gov govern themselves and they would have a better life in America uh, wherever they were being shipped. And Smith says there, um, I think uh, I'm quoting from memory of course, but something, uh, he uses the word Negro, which is common then, mm -hmm. that I don't believe there exists a Negro in Africa, whose intrinsic sense of justice is far broader than what his sordid master is even capable of imagining. This is confounding from a man spending most of his life in a Scottish uh, coastal town, writing about one of the global problems at that time. Now, that problem has been with us for a while, and it's, it's with us today, in a big way. So, um, uh, absolutely, and uh, if you ask me a specific question, I'd be happy to talk. I, I was always told that in Q&A, there's a tendency for me to go on and on and on. <laughs> and so I would let you have a cue. At some stage, I, I hope very much, since it's very much in people's mind, 
we might talk a little about global justice, global climatic justice as mm -hmm. well, because that's, you can't open the papers without well, seeing them. Since you've given the cue, may I give it right back to you and say, could you talk to us about global <laughs> okay. climatic justice as well? Well, I think the, um, uh, the, uh, it's a very important subject, because if there's, to make a minimal point in favor of my book, as it were, the idea that you could have a social contract theory of justice is totally ridiculous by global climatic problem. It's not a problem. You can't think of the idea of the Rawlsian idea of you have justice in the United States and justice in Britain, mm -hmm. and then you have humanitarian relations with others. I think if Maldives are going to be drowned, that's not a matter of humanitarianism, it's a matter of really absolute bloody injustice, if I may use that word, um, in dealing with that. We have to address that issue, big way. So moving away from that general um, conceptual point, uh, I think what we have to think about is a, what rules we need, but not as needy, Rules. What would the impact of those rules would be? Now, and we have to also ask, adopting a NITI, mm -hmm. is that what we want or do we want to change the world? I think it is a great pity that the United States never ratified the Kyoto Agreement. On the other hand, is there any chance that we would get the United States to ratify that agreement which puts no restraint at all? on India, China, or Brazil, or any other country in the world, I think it's very little. Yes. And the world has moved on. Uh, China has become one of the greatest emitters in the world. Given the rhetoric that India produces on seeing that, saying that we should be, we should yes. not take too much restraint in our things, it gives the impression that if we're a major remitter, mm -hmm. we're a fairly minor remit yes. uh, emitter still. And I think our rhetoric needs a bit of improvement. Mm -hmm. It's not because it's not just a matter of rhetoric. Justice is about conversation with people. The fact is that we don't have that much emission, but we will. Uh, we hope India will be rich, and then the emission problem of a very large population would be gigantic. Mm -hmm. To say that we are not going to accept any restraint I think it's a ridiculous position. We have to ultimately accept things. The argument has to be, we would accept a just agreement. A just agreement which is not only fine in paper, on paper, a neat, but a naya that leads to a better world, that allows Indians and the others to expand their living standards and at the same time not kill the world not drown the island. I think it's a great pity, as I read the report with some pain, to see that in some of the debates, Africa had been with China rather than with India. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that we, we ought to... They, I mean, we have been the traditional spokesman of yes, the underdog. We bought the world completely um, dead by speaking on and on on that. Christian Menon gave... Um, Hours and hours of lectures on that subject. Now, I'm not in favor of giving 14-hour speeches, and I haven't yet given one, but uh, I think the commitment that was there to speak for the world underdog should still be there with us now. So I think we have that, and it, it's, it's both important for the world. It's um, important for India, too. It's important for India to think about climatic justice, not only vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Europe, mm -hmm. It is true that they have um, polluted the world in a big way, but it's also important for us to think about Africa, which has hardly, not, hardly started polluting, and we don't want to do to Africa what Europe and America have done to us. Namely, by the time Africa starts growing, we don't want it to have, to have the adversity of having to deal with Europe, the United States, India. China, yeah. India, Brazil, uh, and, and so on. Uh, I think we have to think about those issues. So I think that thinking about global justice is extremely important. To say under no circumstances we will accept a, a, a mandatory restraint 
is ridiculous because we have to, in order for things to function, mm -hmm. we will need money to raise trade. To say that we want a fairer, juster deal, mm -hmm. that's the right rhetoric. Not just for us, but also for, 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 for other countries like Africa. Mm -hmm. Also for countries which are particularly threatened. Um, and, and it pains me to think that India might be siding with, uh, with right. the other side rather than with islands that are threatened with extinction. Uh, I think these are part of issues of global justice, our entire heritage, um, Gandhi, De Gaulle, mm -hmm. uh, and even um, our first Prime Minister Nehru, mm -hmm. there was always a certain presence of the issue of global justice uh, in our mind. And if there's a time not to forget it, it's right now. You know, before you arrive, we were just talking a little bit about, uh, about leadership. Um, and I think uh, the, the discussion did uh, uh, branch a little bit into the sort of uh, dichotomy that you see on one side, India, part of the global world, emerging power. On the other side, a lack of, of leadership on these issues. All right. uh, so here you have a situation where you're saying, where you're very clearly saying that even on the climate change thing, we are not taking that issue. But would you say, in your experience and then knowing everything, that part of that also comes out of the fact that within India itself, on many issues of development, all right, the the justice element, the nyaya element, or the niti is just not present in that stage and does not allow us, therefore, to go on to a world stage and say. You know, uh, you know, with 60% of our population illiterate or whatever, 40%, yeah. etc. Gautam, I, can't, I, I couldn't have put it more eloquently mm -hmm. than you have. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, when I had an opportunity to address the parliament last year on the invitation of, uh, of, of the speaker of Lok Sabha, uh, I did give the first here in Mukherjee lecture. I see that uh, Yunus is going to give the second yes. one. Yes. Has he given it already? Just, just given it. Just, just given it. I haven't seen the text. I'd like to see it. When I gave the first of those, um, I did emphasize that, that, that there are three issues there. One, it, it, no matter what the world thinks, it's not a question of preserving our speech. Mm -hmm. It's a question of making the country a less, less unjust one. That's, we have to get first thing first. If the, if the, um, Tens of millions of children, maybe more than a hundred million children who are undernourished. That is an unlivable condition for all of us, whether or not we are hungry ourselves. With the rampant illiteracy, with the absence of medical care, whereby we provide some of the finest medical care in the world and people could fly in. For that, on the other hand, lots of people go without any treatment. I think this is a situation that is totally intolerable in terms of the naya of injustice here. Secondly, it's also right that insofar as we have to play a... It's not so much that we want our voice to be listened to. We do want to have our voice to have an impact on global thinking. And for that, it, if people say, you know, uh, mend your own house first, mm -hmm. well, I don't think doing it in sequence is important. I think we should exercise our voice in the global world, but at the same time, really put more energy into removing these injustices. But the third point is that it's extremely easy to criticize only the government mm -hmm. and not see that it is the result of the politics of the country, sure. what the opposition party does. I personally happen to be politically sympathetic to the left, that has been my politics, mm -hmm. it's well known. But the main group I was criticizing in Parliament was the left, because I thought that they were putting relatively less focus on issues of this kind, mm -hmm. um, rather than on issues that in a sense are more easily usable for agitation, whether it be um, US-India nuclear deal, uh, which is actually it's, 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 it's a relatively minor issue. Uh, first of all, this whole question of loss of sovereignty um, appears to me to be a, not a left issue, mm. it's a more right issue. On the other hand, uh, to loss of sovereignty only if we have any nuclear further test 
but secondly, I mean, that itself is, I don't see a particular case for us to have a nuclear threat. Secondly, it doesn't read the fact that given the supply of there being a nuclear group, not just the United States, it doesn't depend only on the United States. So I think it's a misread of a reading of what the contract is. But completely forgetting even that, the, the point is that to pull a government down on an issue of this kind, rather than the rampant illiteracy, lack of medical care, hungry children, I think it, it hurts my left-wing sensibilities. So that was the point I was trying to make there, and that applies. Now it applies, if it applies to left parties, obviously it applies to Congress too. Mm -hmm. It applies to right-wing parties mm -hmm. as well. We all, all have to think about it. So I think it's absolutely important that the politics of the country, which includes the government, the opposition, it includes the media, it includes the public discussion, like this one we are having, and, and more public ones that take place, in some of which have taken place. Sometimes we have succeeded. I was quite involved in the right to food movement. Mm -hmm. We have got some distance there yes. with mid the meals and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the agitation don't produce results. Mm -hmm. The agitation about right to inform, information with the leadership of, uh, of Aruna mm -hmm. has been Aruna, quite a yeah. strong, quite a yeah. strong yeah. mover. So. so I think there are things we can do in the world to make the uh, make India a more just place and allow help India to make the world a more just place. That's the ambition to which I think our entire national movement uh, would have warmed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and there, by the way, if I may take two more minutes, you mentioned leadership. Yeah, yeah. I think leadership requires thinking in a way that, that we are able to have, because I happen to think, it, Manmohan Singh happens to be a friend of mine, I've known him from undergraduate days, I do think he's a good leader, yes. but he's at the same time, we also need where he is not constantly